For many years now, we've been running rock pool rambles for children out on these wonderful intertidal reefs here at the Ricketts Point Marine Sanctuary. But since 2003, when the area was declared a sanctuary, we've become increasingly more aware of what lies beneath the sand here as well. And we believe that an equally equivalent walk could be a foreshore walk. And here's a good example of what lies beneath us that we don't often see. That around me is a track of a Polynesian sand snail. Beautiful. And here is where she's resting. Oh, there she is. An exquisitely beautiful shell. Very large, very fit. And she's one of the predator shells that are around here. They often have a lot of red through them as well. Beautifully coloured and variable. So I'll pop her back. This video is a first and I hope it'll lead to a lot of public events that are associated in future with the foreshore. So my name is Ray Lewis and I'd like to welcome you to our first foreshore ramble. You'll note along our foreshores, salt bush, that's what this grey bush is. Uh, and that has a very special purpose. This is a male, you can see his florets, all these yellow flowers and some females over the front there, they look quite different. Um, but uh, they pull salt out of the soil here, because it's very salty from the winds and the sea. And they pull the salt out of the soil to improve it. And they put the salt on the underside of their leaves. And it's quite tasty. Used in Melbourne restaurants these days, and um, it's a lovely bush. You get to get to really like them. And then after the salt bush to improve the soil, we need to have things like the wattles that you can see in the distance down here. Normally they're a lot closer. I don't know why we haven't got wattles here. This is a bank here behind me, not a wattle. And the wattle takes nitrogen out of the air and pushes that into the soil. So the soil has been desalted, nitrogen added. And then, as you can see, all the bigger trees in the background there can then sort of thrive in beneficiated soil. There's more to it than that, but that's the simple approach to what's happening here on our beaches. And any time you look along one of our beaches where we've got the salt bushes, you'll see that gradation from the grey salt bushes to the much darker wattles and then the big trees. And also here, which is really nice, is that we have um, uh, need to stabilise our dunes. And we have a little grass of our own, um, very fine little grass here that you wouldn't normally notice. But also we have spinifex and you can see the spinifex through here in their flowering time. These are all the girls with all those flowers on them. And they um, also stabilise the soil. They have a wonderful flower like that, that when the summer and the hot summer days really come that breaks off and they often get picked up in willy, willy willies on the cement out here and the hot thing and they whirl around you can stand amongst them to be standing in a whirl of, of these lovely lovely flowers. And this is a seed pot of the girls. And the last thing is with the spinifex which you can see spread quite so really well here holding this dune for us um, the, uh, where they send out a runner if it, uh, the wind blows it back that runner will often anchor on the stress point where it's been bent and then grow forward again. So that's quite a nice little thing to know. And the males look a little different. I think I'll just go over and pick up a male and show you. And there's a, a male spinifex flower, quite different to the girls in flower, or male spinifex, quite different to the girls in flower. I'm sitting here on a beach seat that's been 
perfectly positioned to look out over the reef and it's in honour of my good friend Mike Letch who passed away a few years back and Mike was probably the world's leading disabled diver and a great naturalist and the creatures that he loved best are portrayed in this lovely carving behind me. This beach is a truly outstanding place for disabled diving. In fact, we strongly believe it will become a world centre for such when we built the new facility behind us down here where the Yacht Club is. It's so important because this whole area out here, acres and acres of it, is only about two metres deep and the bottom is filled with glorious, glorious algae, seaweeds, grasses, crustaceans, fish of all kinds and that's perfect for disabled diving because people don't have to get deep into deep water to do to see what they need to see and enjoy it. Also the water is a little balmier in these shallows so the season can be extended because with disabled diving we normally start when the water is about 18 degrees. It's a little warm in the shallows probably a month earlier than outside. And there are four other things to do with disabilities here that are really so important. Behind us over here, or in front of me, there's a disabled ramp that leads right into the water so we can get the wheelchairs in. Up to my left up here, there's a major uh, complex that inc includes a disabled toilet and disabled showers and heated showers. And they are very important too because when you're disabled, you um, uh, come out of the water un unusually cold and you need to be warmed up. It has just over the back here, all the facilities and normal things you you'd need in terms of hospitals, uh, bus stations, shops, all the facilities we need are here as well. So it's a terrific place. And I'd like to talk about the last uh, aspect of it, which is to do with this beach and all beaches, is that there's a very strange thing that happens here, that the sand down by the edge gets to be very, very, very small and fine. And the sand further up, way up the top, tends to get to be much, much coarser, and I'll walk in and just show you the difference here. Now the reason is that because of the reef system, the energy gets taken out of the waves, and all the sand in the water that's tumbling and tumbling and tumbling, as the energy decreases in the waves, the larger particles tend to fall out and finer particles tend to come up on the beach. If there's a big storm, they all come up. So right up the top where waters go in a big storm, you find very soft sand that's hard to walk on. But down near the edge, we'll so often find very, very tight, fine grains of sand stuck together electromagnetically, electrostatically, much tighter, and you can move wheelchairs on them. So that's the whole point of it. Along here, we can run wheelchairs of all kinds and go, give everyone a lot of improved access. And here's a very clear example of the two types of sand together as well. You can see the very rough particles up here, which are um, calcium silicate and, and sand itself. And, uh, and then the very, very fine particles here, the much greyer, much tougher look. Out here in this marine sanctuary, we're blessed with a splendid reef system caused by some iron materials coming down and infusing into the calcite and the limestone about three to five million years ago and giving us a hard reef that survived. And as a result of that, with a substrate right throughout the area, it's a garden of Eden for sea grasses in particular, uh, seaweeds in particular. But we've also got sea grasses in the sandy area. And there is a significant difference when we're talking about seaweeds. We really mean algae are the natural things that grow in the sea and the sea grasses are those that have actually come in from the land eventually and they're just like normal grasses and you really couldn't quite tell the difference and so the differences the differences too that once you know them is that sea weeds or algae have a foot as such to anchor onto things so you won't find them very often at all in sand because they've got nothing to hold on to. But you will find them where there are rocks, piles, sunken boats, and that sort of thing, because they've got what's called a hold foot on the bottom. It's interesting too with the algae that they can be classified fairly simply in three ways, and that's green, brown, and red. The green 
like that Ulva sea lettuce, and that is um, edible, but tasty, untasty, it's like cardboard, and that's right near the surface, called Ulva. And then when you get down a little further, you get the, uh, the brown weeds, and then deeper in the water again, you get really red weeds. Now it's only a general rule, but it's of interest. And one of the nice things you can tell is with the seagrass that when the whether the swans are around or not, you don't even have to turn around and have a look. But if you can see in front of you lots and lots of seagrass chewed off at the top, just blown up on the beach, that means the swans are around because the swans love it. They pull it up, they eat the white part on the bottom, which is very, very tasty, and the top leaves just float into the shore. And then the swans poop in the water, and that uh, swan dropping is the, the major fertiliser for our seagrass. So last year here we had a lot of swans and these beaches were littered with green seagrass so it would mean I think this year we're going to have absolutely splendid seagrass beds and they're really really important because many fish lay their eggs in them and it's the beginning of the uh, life chain in places like this right at the bottom of the food chain. Found this in the water it just looks like an ordinary little plant, but it's called Hormosaurio banksii, or more colloquially, uh, Neptune's necklace. And Neptune's necklace was a very, very important plant in 1900 or so in Sydney because Australian waters lack um, iodine. And so if you lack iodine, you get goiter, which is a big throat growth, which is common when I was a boy. But this is rich in iodine. So children used to eat Neptune's necklace every day, eat a couple of berries to prevent uh, iodine, uh, iodine or um, goiter. So that, that's in, and that's common here in the sanctuary. And that is something which I might bring closer to the camera. Is the egg case of a special snail called Polynesis. And I'll show you one of those later. But Polynesis is a snail that uh, lays these eggs that come up on the beach in hundreds of thousands much of the time and each one has I've counted by dissecting and looking at 10,000 eggs and they wash up onto the sand the little creatures go into the sand and they live on all that broken down seaweed under them under the sea, their beach line as they work their way back to the sea obviously they're pretty tasty and predated upon because if there's that many eggs per per jelly um, we'd be inundated with them otherwise if they weren't so many eaten so they must have a very poor survival rate but it's not a um, what people often think it is a jellyfish or something, it's actually the egg case of Polynesis. One of the really interesting things about algae is that in the earlier centuries, from the 10th century through to about the 15th or 16th when we developed barometers and things like that, was used as a weather indicator by people in the northern hemisphere, particularly in the colder areas. And that's because when you get a bit of particularly, particularly kelp, and mostly only the kelps, when they're washed up on the shore, they turn black. And here's one that's slowly going black. And once they're black, they're fairly well dehydrated. But if re-immersed in the water, within minutes, they're back to turning green. And we've got a couple of images of that to show you that I took a couple of days ago. So what's the use of that? Well, if you're a farmer, you hang that up in a barn, black algae, black kelp, and the weather's starting to change, the air's getting moister, but you can't quite feel it. The algae becomes very slack and goes green again. So you get a fabulous weather indicator. The only kelp we've got around this particular place that might do that is this one, which is called uh, Wakami, and it's a foreign import that we don't really want, but uh, it is effective in that, in that way and it's quite edible in, in passing. But by the way, never ever ever eat any algae you find on the beach because they get hydrogen disulfide I believe in them and it can give you a sick stomach. Only fresh stuff in the water if you're so inclined. I like to talk about these rocky things because it makes the beach walk much more interesting and it's really part of our sea country cultural heritage. But you see these little holes? Each of those is a sea anemone. It's a little creature about that long with lots of tentacles on the top. We have about eight or nine different types around the bay. 
But what's really magnificent about these creatures is they have little stinging cells called nematocysts in their little tentacles and tiny fish come through, they sting it, paralyze it and eat it. But more than that, they're anchored on rocks underneath with a little sand on top that they like. And when the tide's coming in, which is starting to do now, the, they'll start coming out, slowly expanding out and feeling. Kids can put their fingers in them mostly with no problems at all because they don't seem to be able to break through human flesh. But they're spectacular little creatures. But more than that, <coughs> they breed in so many ways it's unbelievable. They can breed through bisexual reproduction between two of them, exchanging the little cells. They can breathe through fishing, cloning, or they can split down the middle and turn into two creatures. And they actually around the top of them as well, they can create little buds of new anemones and they float off in the water and go somewhere else. There's hardly any other way to do it that I know of. And I would think there'd be a fair bit of research in the world we should be looking at exactly how and why they manage that wonderful reproduction system. Now also, I found on the beach as we walked up here, fairly commonly a sponge. And that sponge is a dry one, it's dead. That's its calcium carbonate skeleton. It has holes to suck water in, other holes called osteos and osculus to pump the used water out and they extract the food from it. And they get a whole series of miracles that are totally unexpected. First of all, they pump their body weight in, uh, uh, in water, can, they can, every few minutes. Secondly, down inside them they have little channels off to one side with little flagellates that wobble so that if the tide's not moving and, and feeding the new fresh water with little animals in it, <coughs> they can create their own movement of water. And also they have a lot of redundant genome. They started off as a little mosquito-like thing that settled on a rock and then became a highly specialised colony of animals. But that redundant genome, I'm told, is sufficient to build a mammal. Incredible, isn't it? Another half a dozen miracles with these sorts of things that you wouldn't normally know of. And another thing here, while the tide's coming in and we're trying to beat it, is a very special worm called Galeolaria, a limey worm. And out here, you can see the last couple. We're photographing them from here because it's really important to explain their role. It's a little, there's thousands of little worms in there, one in each case, a bit like coral, and they have a little cap on the top. When the, when the water comes through they open up and little black fingers come out and they feed and eat. But the really interesting thing is they sit at half tide. You can see that they haven't gone up the rock at all, they've stopped about where the high tide would be and they proceed a little bit below the tide that's coming in. Now that's very valuable for us to know because on any pile, anything that sticks half out of the water around Victoria and particularly the bay, you can have a look out inside and see how the tide's going with it's half high or low, depending on where the Galeolaria worms are. And now we'll wander up to our rather splendid cliffs here, mostly calcite, but some special Beaumaris sandstone ones with the iron infused into it, and have a look at a fossil or two. I, um, I just popped over here because I thought I'd see a fossil there, which I did which will show you a better one than that. That's a, a track from the Boa Moriensis worm that we'll show you. And I saw this rock and I thought, well, maybe we'll find a fossil there. So I lifted it over and there, <laughs> no fossil, but look at all these lovely little amphipods. That means many leg, many legged uh, little creatures. They're tiny little shrimps. And uh, that's the sort of life that you find in our reef system. It's so rich that anything you turn over, for, any rock you turn over, any leaf you turn over, every seaweed you'll examine closely has got life on it. Thought you might be interested. The, um, the Beau Morris area in particular is famous for fossils. In fact, it's world famous for some fossils we'll talk about in a moment. But about five to 10 million years ago, we had a lot of sandstone and calcite get together and form these cliffs through compressing uh, sand. And then three to five million years ago, you can see this very, very hard iron-like material with it, the ferric oxide or whatever it is that moved through and infused into the calcite and made tough cliffs which gave us all our wonderful reef system and right in here is a lovely fossil of what's called Beaumoriensis after Beaumaris of course and it's a little yabby and there were vast numbers of them here at the time 
and that's the tracks, they're very communal and all those tracks linked up through the entire area. Now they're more exciting fossils than that that have been found uh, and I've got an image of one of them that you'll see and that is of a sperm whale's tooth which is in excess of the five million years old which is the time when a current whale which is now mild and not a killer but it was a killer whale in its time and had a tooth that big. We've also found down here um, a crocodile's jaw over five million years old so things weren't too friendly on the beach down here when the Aborigines were here although they weren't here five million years ago of course and uh, we found a number of other fairly wonderful exciting things and that continues so much so that only in the last few weeks a number of locals have got together to form a society to protect those fossils uh, because they're world, world importance and one of the things we found down here has only been found one other place in the world and so the fossils and the situation in which they're in in terms of uh, the carbon dating of uh, materials around them what they ate and what they didn't is really important so you will see fossils all the way along the beach but most of them are unrecognisable you just recognise that it's something unnatural there there's the odd tree trunk that you actually will recognise, but mostly they're not things like a, a big bat in, in the sand or something like they have in China, a big dragonfly. But they are wonderful and hugely important. I think we'll wander down to the beach now again, and I'll show you some of the other things you're likely to find on a normal beach walk. We're nearing the end of the talk and I'd like to sort of finish off with a number of little samples and things you'd normally find on the beach as you move along and something you can look forward to if you ever do a good long walk up here along this beach from McGregor's Rock back to the tea house at uh, Ricketts Point. Every rock is covered with little shells as well and they're really cool. One's called Ostrocochlea constrictor because it's got all the little stripes of a boa constrictor on it and they're really interesting. They've got a capacity, they've got a little um, uh, when the tide goes out they're going to get exposed to the sun and, and if they get exposed to the sun their body's external they'll just dry up and die. So they've got their, their flesh on the inside and their shell on the outside to protect them. And they've got a manhole cover to close off so that no matter how warm they get they don't lose all their moisture. Of course we're different. We've got our bones on the inside and our flesh on the outside because we've learned to cover ourselves up. We don't need all the hair we used to do to keep us uh, cool and warm. So they're really cool but they're much more interesting things as well. That almost anyone can find one on the right sort of day and that's what's left over from a sea, sea urchin. It's called a test, a T-E-S-T. -E it's in the water and we've got a lovely one around here, reddish, yellowish, whitish one, it varies all the time. It's got long spines that come out to protect itself when it's alive. It's got short spines that move food around to its mouth which is on the on the bottom here. It has five teeth, a bit like our teeth, that eat and move along the bottom. They have their anus on the top and they have another wonderful thing too, that I've actually seen one on a rock sitting there quietly under the water and up came a big sea star. And the big sea star was the 11-armed Australian sea star and it crept along with its bottom legs while it slowly tried to look as if it was busy up here with the others. This thing waited for a while and then off it went about that speed. And I thought, how's that possible? I can't see the big legs moving. And then dropped off a, a little ledge and hid. What happens is, around the bottom here, their little holes appeared and they dropped out little water legs, little things like little pins about that long. And they've pumped them up with water, energised them, and they use those legs to run off on. So it's just another little miracle and you'll often find sea urchin tests. There's a, an issue with shells around here too that primarily you're going to find two sorts of shells. We're going to find um, bivalves, which are the mussels and things like that that are in two halves. And you're going to find gastropods, which are single shells uh, in one piece and uh, amongst the gastropods there are two particular types. One is a, a, a carnivore shell you could call it, and one's a herbivore, call it that. Now this one, the turban shell, wonderful to eat from the Aborigines, is a herbivore shell and we can tell that because it's got a very round opening. Round openings normally mean you're optimising the grazing area as you move along the microalgae. But We've also got a lot of other shells around with a long slot in the bottom. These are beautiful, that's Fingler's Triton and that's a muresque. Muresques are very common around here. Someone seems to collect them all the time but uh, they must be obsessive because you don't even need to take one home. Um, but they've got that long track and along that long track comes what's called a radula. And that radula drills holes 
in most of the little sedentary shells that sit in one spot, the little bivalves. It just drills holes in them, sends down a plasticizer that softens up their body, then it sucks the body up into their mouth and then moves on to the next. And that's what's caused when you see that. Now that is a, a Novo Callista shell, normally in two pieces, but it's been drilled through by one of these creatures and killed and eaten. So it's dog eat dog out there. Reasonably commonly found, very difficult to understand what it is. It's a U-shaped or M-shaped, whatever you like, thing, looks like it's got a little bottom on it. Very, very tough, plasticky feeling. You'd think it must have come from the land in the rubbish bins or something. But in fact, it's the swim bladder of the globefish. And she sh compresses it and sinks, or expands it and rises, so she doesn't have to provide any energy swimming to stay at any depth in the water that she seeks. Beautiful fish she is, big spines. Problem is that her liver and her other parts of her body are super toxic. They have tetrodotoxin in them, that's what kills the Japanese that you read about each year when they have been improperly prepared. So that's the swim bladder of the globefish. What else have we got? Oh, that's really interesting. These two are egg cases from sharks. That's the most famous shark for us. That's from the Port Jackson shark and that's fairly smooth and when it's born the mother puts it in the mouth and she turns it into a rock, twists it in, a rock crevice under the water and it takes about nine months for a little baby shark to grow out of there and come out. These very quickly within about one day dry and they're hard like that. So that's the uh, egg case of the Port Jackson shark and this is another one pretty much the same in the cellulose feel to it that's from a draft board shark. We don't see too many of those around but they're, they're really nice, lovely things. And finally what have I got here of interest? Well, not quite finally, abalone shell used uh, by many, many people to make buttons and things like that in the past. It's got it's a local abalone and it's now protected here in the sanctuary. Um, a sea star we don't want, that's the Northern Pacific sea star. It has about 100,000 eggs a time and uh, it uh, takes away obviously food and more from our local sea stars. So we try and eradicate those, but you need a license to know what you're doing because it looks like one or two of our other sea stars that are much less common, but somewhat similar. These are always turned up on their tips and normally have a bit of reddish around them. This one's dried out. Um, two more things. Um, you'll find a lot of little shore crabs and one of them has a sawtooth top. And that sawtooth top is just like a bandsaw but it doesn't use that at all, that's just how you recognise it. And that's called Mayenus, and that's a European shore crab. And that's another exotic like this that we don't want in the bay, because they can breed up and take it, the food away from other creatures. But it seems to me it's been around for about 200 years apparently. It's about time we gave it a naturalisation certificate. And it doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Uh, it's a habitual problem people talk about, but it's hard to see what it does. And finally, we're really fortunate too that we actually have coral here. And this is the same coral that's in the barrier reef, Versipora. And Versipora's got wonderful, wonderful little uh, slots in it where each individual lives and grows. It's like little cartwheels when you see them close up. And I think we've got a close up image to show how beautiful they are. And uh, they come in a number of colours out here in the right season. F fabulously soft greens, pinks and reddish colours, a little bit of yellow. And we haven't got too much of it, but I gather as our water's warm, they'll get bigger and bigger because at the moment, Biggest I've ever seen is about a half a basketball size, whereas in the barrier reef, of course, they grow much more. But they're a very important and valued part of the ecosystem here. And exactly on the same night, with the same moon, that the corals spawn in the great barrier reef that everyone gets excited about and goes to see, they actually spawn out here as well. And none of us bother, <laughs> because the water's colder probably. So move on and have a look now at a couple of um, other issues that aren't quite beachside but are important. Just a little extra on sea stars. The biggest one is the 11-armed sea star, the Australian one. 
and they can often range from say 10 to 13 legs depending on the situation. So we've just added 10 and 13 divided by 2 and got 11 and called them 11 armed sea stars. But the interesting thing about sea stars is that if you, people used to get these amurensis or these uh, northern pacific sea stars, catch them in the, because, they, because they'll eat, they'll catch on a hook and you, when you're fishing out there they'll come up with the, the bait and, and you've got them in the boat. And people say well they're no good and they chop them up and throw them back in the water. But what that does is create five stars. Because any of these stars, if it breaks off a leg with a tiny bit of the core area, will regrow a new starfish. And if you're out there with snorkeling, you'll often find a starfish with two or three big legs and two or three really little legs. And that's where they've been attacked by something and half eaten. Anyway, I'm here because I'd like to talk a little bit about um, things like uh, problems with the bay. And one of the big problems is pollution. A really big problem. In this case here, on the beach just north of the Bay Morris Yacht Club, we've got a big drain. I'm walking over here to show you how big it is and the echoing sound from it all. Now when there's heavy street water, all the dog feces, all the rubbish, all the cigarette butts that people are throwing into the streets carelessly flows out onto the bay just here behind us, 20 feet away. So we have some general rules. After heavy rain, no one swims or snorkels here for 24 hours to give it a chance to break down. But it's more serious than 24 hours because one of the things that comes down regularly are plastic, say, Coke bottles or lemonade bottles or something like that. Now, each plastic Coke bottle of about that size breaks down out there under the effect of sunlight and the salt in the water and the other chemicals, and it winds up being 24,000 microparticles. And because of the nature of plastics, each one of those becomes progressively more toxic as it sinks down and ultimately it sits in the bottom of the bay where we can't get it out. Now fish can't tell the difference between those microparticles and phytoplankton, zooplankton, thing they might, ex they might actually eat. And so they get full up with it. They can't digest it. We catch the fish, we eat it, and that can pass into the human food chain. And it is. In some place in the world it's really serious. We're fairly fortunate in Port Phillip Bay that with that entrance, with her, which only probably only 4% interchange with the sea every year, anything that comes into this bay, we put in there. Every one of the 300,000 cigarette butts a day during summer that flow down into the bay, we put there. Every plastic bottle and every bit of plastic toxin out there, we put there. Not anyone else, not the Indonesians or the Chinese or the Americans or the English from the stuff flowing around the world, we put there from our creeks and streams and rivers. Now, is it a problem? Well, I believe, and I'm told, there are 300 drains this side of the bay alone. Not all big like this, some bubble up under the sand, some are pipes out into the water. It's a very serious issue. That and coastal erosion, and you saw that in the earlier images of the, the cliff face up there, the calcite cliff, just how deeply it's all eroding back to the road. And we'll have a look further down as a final shot, I think, on some sandbagging which protected the beach from erosion. We have a range of tides here in Port Phillip Bay and in fact every single day we have two high tides and two low tides. One of the high tides is a little higher than the first and one of the low tides is a little lower than the other so we call them a high high and a low high and a low and a low low. But uh, there are four and because they happen in with the phases of the moon and the position of the moon they're on a cycle not quite the full daily cycle. So each day these tides and the set of tides is about an hour later. There are plenty of tide tables to show you. And there's evidence of it here today when you can see the lines. And in an image that'll back me in a moment, you'll see the lines much more clearly. And the reason why it's messy today is A because of onshore winds, which also can affect tides, and high pressure or low pressure um, systems out in the bite can also affect us. Uh, the tides, but primarily it's the moon itself that's 80% responsible, and also the sun. Sometimes the moon and the sun are in conjunction or in opposition, and that can make for higher or lower tides. Now, in the, in the image you'll see, you'll see four tides, a classic day, but at the moment we had an extraordinary week in which the moon was 50,000 kilometres closer to Earth than it normally is. And as a result, 
it caused what they call a wolf moon and that meant much stronger tides, very high tides and very low tides. So that mucked up the usual tide lines that you'd find here. So it's nice to know these things about the tides. We mentioned before how fortunate we are here with our intertidal reefs and our subtidal reef systems that are so tough and hard and survived for centuries and all the things that grow around them. And they've been fortunate in another way that they break down the wave action that comes across the bay and, uh, and can damage the foreshore. Well, not always. Sometimes when the fetch and the wind strength and fetches the distance the wind carries over the waves, so from the head, as I mentioned before, 30 to 50 kilometres, from the west over there about 60, and from just down here to the south maybe less, but still that's a lot of water for the wind to come over, and when it does, it builds up the waves. And only two days ago, I think I mentioned, water was way up here. Now, on a bad stormy day when you've got a high tide as well, it can rip out everything here, and it did. About seven or eight years ago, it had cut out all this sand right back to the path, that far off the path. And we would have had a $100,000 worth of work to replace all that path and what we'd lost. And just in time, the council came down and had installed what we called geofabric bags. And these are they. And they're still in fine condition. People trample further up there when I was sitting on Mike's chair before, and it doesn't seem to penetrate them. They're lasting for years, and they stopped and protected, stopped the waves and protected the foreshore. And then uh, Citywide Services came along, their bushland crew, and replanted this very sympathetically to the natural replanting. Within about three years, it was back to normal. And already we've got natural banksias reappearing and some extra wattles appearing and many other plants. So it's just worth mentioning that uh, the threats to our wonderful beach here in, uh, in Beaumaris and Bayside uh, and not only pollution, but they're the natural things that are happening as well, and we can do something about it. Here's one thing we can do. So that's the end of it. I hope you enjoyed this beach walk, and you've got a feeling for just why we all love it so much. <laughs>